Daniel chapter 7, which goes right along with Daniel chapter 2. And in Daniel 7, we found clearly that there were nine identifying points for the Antichrist power. Nine identifying points. Tonight, we're going to focus on one part of one verse of chapter 7 for the whole night. You say, how in the world can you do that? How can you take one verse and spend all night on one verse? Well, you're going to see. Because Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, here's what it says. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and this is the part we're going to focus on, and shall intend to change times and law. Now, to understand this text, we have to back up a verse, and we have to read what leads to it. Actually, we're backing up two verses. This is Daniel chapter 7, verse 23. And remember, we were talking about the Antichrist power. That's who this was talking about. Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall shred it down and break it in pieces. And if you remember, the fourth beast, we describe, we talk about beasts that were represented, or kingdoms are represented by beasts. The United States has an eagle. Remember, we talked about that. And we talked about France has a rooster, and Canada has a beaver. Well, here, when it talks about this beast, this was a nondescript beast with, with, that was just hideous, with ten horns. This was an artist's conception of it. And we found that a beast in prophecy represents a kingdom. So when it says that fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom on earth, it's talking about the kingdoms that followed Babylon. Remember, there was Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. Do you remember we talked about that the other night? So this is just a bit of review, bringing you up to speed. Verse 24 says, The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom. Now, if you remember, we talked about the fact that ten horns are ten kings... The horns represent kingdoms. Do you remember that? So the ten horns on the head of that beast represent ten kingdoms. We also discovered that these are the powers that existed in Western Europe. And you probably recognize all of these here. And the Alamanni were called the Germans, the Burgundians were the Swiss, the Franks were the French, the Lombards were the Italians, the Saxons were English, the Slavi were the Portuguese, and the Visigoths were Spanish. And there were three kingdoms here that are now extinct. Remember we talked about that. And we're going to hit on that just a little more this evening. So among these ten kingdoms, if you look here, it says, and another shall rise after them, after the ten, another rise, and he shall be different from the first ones, and he shall subdue three kings. You remember that? He shall subdue three kings. Well, we just looked at that chart. These are the three kings that he uprooted. The interesting thing is subdue literally means to put down or to trod down under, to trample on. So in other words, this is saying that he would destroy three kingdoms or kings. And those three kings were the Heriliad, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. You remember this? Is it ringing a bell? So this little review hopefully will help you just a little bit. In Daniel 7.25, it says he, that's, this is the Antichrist power we're talking about, shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and laws. Interesting. So we discussed who this power was, and if anybody wasn't here the other night, you, this might be a little shocking to you, but this is actually speaking of the Roman papacy. That's who this is talking about. And we've got that covered in a, in a handout that you can have. It's this one right here. It's on the back table. Is it back there, Mary, over on the side? Okay, so if you didn't get one the other night, you can get one. I will tell you that this is not complete. Uh, we had to get this from another ministry because the one that we are preparing is not ready yet. But hopefully we'll have it ready within the next few months. It takes a lot of time to write and edit and put these things together and get the photos that you want. It just it takes a lot of time. So if you notice here, it says he shall ch intend to change. And I like that wording. Shall intend to change times and law. Now, the first question is, how did this power intend to change times? We're going to hit the first part of that. How did this power intend to change times? I'd like you to open your Bible to Genesis chapter 1. This is the first book of the Bible, Old Testament. I didn't put a page number because I think most of us can find it. 
<laughs> Genesis chapter 1. And you know, I want to tell you, there are people who I've studied the Bible with. You know, we kind of chuckle. But I've studied the Bible with people who have, didn't even know where the book of Genesis was. So that's why, you know, we don't want to talk down to anyone. I've been there. I know what, it, what it's like to, you know, you hear a book like Hosea or Joel, and I say, where in the world is that? And you've got a thousand some pages here, and you've got to find this little tiny book. So that's why we do it this way, and it helps us to be able to roll along quicker. So if you take a look at Genesis, the first chapter, I don't know if you remember the first night, Rick and I told you, I told you, Rick and I always go to Genesis. And this is where we start, every study. Genesis chapter 1, verse 5. This is in the creation account. God's getting ready to create, and it says, God called the light day, is everybody there? And the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. <coughs> evening and morning were the first day, it says. Now take a look at verse 8. And God called the firmament heaven. So the evening and the morning were the second day. Now I know we're skipping verses, but I'm trying to establish something here. Now take a look at verse 13. Genesis 1, 13. So the evening and the morning were the third day. Now take a look at verse 19. Are you getting a picture? So the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Well, let's go on. Genesis verse 23, 123. So the evening and the morning were the fifth day. And Genesis 131, it says, And God, then God saw that everything he made, or he saw everything he had made, and indeed it was very good. It wasn't just good. All the other times he said that it was good. It was good. It was good. But this time he says it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Now, there's a reason why I'm taking this time to show you this. You notice, when does the day begin? Evening. evening. The day begins in evening. You say, well, that's odd. I thought the day began in the morning. Well, the way God reckoned time in the Bible is when the sun sets is when the day ends. Isn't that true? That makes sense to me. Sun goes down, the day one day has ended, the next day begins right at sunset. This was God's way of reckoning time all through Scripture. All through Scripture, even in the New Testament. When a day, when the sun went down, it was the next day. So technically, it's Friday. On our calendar, it's Friday right now. When the sun set, it became Friday. And that sounds odd. Well, I want you to know, this is one way that times were changed. Because the Roman power was the one that made the day begin and end at midnight. And that was done through Catholicism, through the popes. The day begins and ends at, at, at midnight instead of when the sun sets. Does that make sense? Many of us might not know that's part of the Roman system. So let's take a look. Let me see. I can't read the little screen on there. Okay. So how did this power intend to change law? So we've already covered times, and that was just a partial one. We're going to look at that more. We're coming back to this in a, moment, in a little bit. So how did this power intend to change law? Well, we're already there. Genesis chapter 2, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth and, the, and all the hosts of them were finished. And verse 2 says, And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done, then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. Have you ever read those words before? God creates the earth in six days, and what's he do on the seventh day? He rests. He rests. Now notice there are three things that he did. He rested, he blessed the seventh day, and he sanctified it. What does it mean to sanctify something? Set apart. set apart. Set apart for a special purpose or to make holy. This is what sanctified means. So he blessed the seventh day, it says. He sanctified it. He made it holy. And he himself, does God need to rest? No, he doesn't. But he rested. He was giving us an example to go by. Now, let's turn to Exodus chapter 20. It's the next book of the Bible. Exodus chapter 20. And you'll notice in Exodus chapter 20, if you have a seminar Bible, that's page 70. I'm taking you here for a specific reason. Exodus 20. 
This is where God speaks the commandments. What else did he do with the commandments? <coughs> did he just speak them? No, he wrote them on stone. He wrote them on stone. Very good. Thank you. That's exactly right. He carved them in stone. I mean, have you ever heard the old saying, well, nothing's etched in stone? <laughs> well, the commandments were. So we can say that they were carved in stone. Let's take a look at Exodus chapter 20. And if you look at verse 1, it says, And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. Which commandment is that? It's the first one. The first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. Now, if you were here Monday night, then you saw a way that there are people that are putting other gods before the Most High God. We're going to touch on that near the end of this lecture tonight. You shall have no other gods before me. Now, it goes on and it talks about making a carved image and bowing down to it. If you look at verse 5, that's where the second commandment begins. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. Talking about the carved images. There's nothing wrong with having a little... As far as I'm concerned, if you've got a little statue of a little old man fishing or something, you know, in your house, but are you worshiping it? We shouldn't bow down to them. We shouldn't worship them. And that's what this is telling us. It, and there, I don't think there's anything wrong with having a photograph of somebody or something, someone that you know. So we have to be balanced when we look at these things. Verse 7 says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. What does that mean? Taking the Lord's name in vain. A lot of people think that, that means just using it in a curse, in a way of cursing, a curse word. But you know, if you make a promise and you promise somebody or you swear to somebody something, or if you, I swear to God I'm going to do this, that could be using his name in vain. If we use his name in a way that we're representing him and we're misrepresenting, that could be using his name in vain. So it's not just using a foul mouth and, and saying things. And really, God isn't a name. God is just a title. Right. It's not a name. Uh, just like man. If I say, if all, if all the gentlemen were turned around facing that one, I say, excuse me, sir, they would all turn around. But if I said, excuse me, Fred, Fred's going to know I'm talking to him. Right? So when we talk about our God using his name in vain, we should know what that name is. Does anybody know what God's name is? Yes, the English pronunciation is Jehovah. The Hebrew is Yahweh. Uh, that's what we think it is, anyway. And even in Spanish, the name, if you get a Spanish Bible, it uses the name Jehovah all through the Spanish Old Testament. So it's really interesting when you see those things. A lot of times in English, we don't have those translated that way. We talked about that just the other night. So when we look at this, we, let's, let's go down to the fourth commandment. Commandment number four. Notice, what word does it begin with? Remember. remember. We have to remember. It says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. Then look what this does. This refers right back to Genesis. Right back to Genesis, where we just were. It says, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and he rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Does that sound like... It's directly out of Genesis, chapter 2. It's, it's right out of Genesis. He's quoting right from Genesis, chapter 2, when he's saying this. Well, let's look at verse 12. Honor your father and mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God has given you. You know, this is the only commandment with a promise, we're told in the Bible. And the promise is, if you honor your father and your mother, you can live a long time. Because if I didn't honor my father when I was a young man, it would cut my life short quick. <laughs> Verse 6. You shall not murder. Now some say kill, but the literal translation is murder. Uh, number 7 in verse 14. You shall not commit adultery. Number 8. You shall not steal. Number 9. 
you shall not bear false witness or lie against your neighbor. And number 10 is you shall not covet. Covet your neighbor's house or his wife or his male servant nor his female servant nor his ox nor his donkey nor anything that is in your neighbor's house. That's the Ten Commandments. This is what is otherwise known as the Decalogue. This is what the Hebrews call it. They call it the Decalogue sometimes. Or some may refer to it as the Ten Words. I don't know if you've ever heard that before. So it's interesting to me when we look at this, there's some interesting things about this that we're going to examine right now about these commandments. Particularly one. Let's take a look. We already discussed this. Who wrote the Ten Commandments? God himself. Then the Lord delivered to me the two tablets of stone written with the finger of God. And I want you to think about this. This is the only part of the Bible that we know of that is told to us that God himself wrote. He trusted men. He, he inspired men to write the words on paper. But this part was important enough to God that he art it in stone. Is it really that important? It must be if he did it. So... Let's continue to see how this law changed. The facts about the fourth commandment. This is very interesting. It's the only commandment that begins with the word remember. It's the longest commandment of all. There are more words in it than any other commandment. The Sabbath was kept before sin because God rested on a Sabbath day, didn't he? Before there was sin. It points back to creation in the fourth commandment because it says, for in six days God rested, right? Or seven, after six days of creation, he rested on the seventh. And then we have, it's the only commandment that's made holy. A lot of times we miss these things when we read through it. And it, it identifies God as the creator. Let's take a look at it again. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. He made it holy. So which day is the Sabbath day? According to the Bible, it's the seventh day. Exodus tells us the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. If you look at a calendar, you'll notice that Sunday is the first day. Now, I've had people that will say to me, how do we know? How do we know? There's no way to know because the calendar's been changed. We're going to get to that. But before we get to that, I want to just give you a little something to think about. Anytime the subject comes up and somebody wants to argue about which day is the seventh day, I don't, I don't like arguing. I just like presenting the facts from the Bible. And if they want to argue with God, they can do it. I'm not going to. I've tried in the past, and he wins every time. And, and the thing is, if you ask anybody, what day was Jesus resurrected on? Sunday. Sunday. What do we call it in the Bible, even? In the Bible, though, it calls it what? First day. The first day. No one will argue that Jesus but wasn't resurrected on the first day. I don't know of any Christian. If they are, if, they, if you know of somebody, speak up because I need to know this. Do you know of any Christian that will say, no, Jesus was not raised on the first day, he was raised on another day? I don't know of any. And I don't know of any Christian that will tell you that the first day is not Sunday. So if Sunday is the first day, what day is Saturday? It's the, last. It's the seventh day. And sometimes when I say that to a preacher, they cringe. They don't know, they, how do you get around that? Well, you don't. You don't. And Mark chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Now when the Sabbath was passed, this is actually when Jesus had been, he had been crucified, he had been put in the tomb, okay? He had been put in the tomb, and then the Sabbath was over. And it says, very early in the morning on the, which day? On the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. What day did Jesus go into the tomb? Friday. Friday. In fact, the Bible tells us it was preparation. Well, preparation for what? Sabbath. Preparation for the Sabbath. Because the Sabbath was the next day, and then Jesus rose on a Sunday. So he was in the tomb for parts of three days. I hope to get back to that if I can remember that. Um, Rick, try to remember. I want to talk about the fact that Jesus died on Friday and was resurrected on Sunday, just for a moment, 
toward the end of the presentation. So, Jesus was resurrected on the first day of the week, which we now call Sunday. Any disagreement with that at all? Okay. I just want to make sure. So, many people, though, today will tell you that Sabbath is Sunday. That's what they'll tell you. But this text here shows us that the Sabbath was actually passed when Sunday morning came. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says seventh day is Saturday. So on what day did Jesus customarily worship? We all know the answer to this. Luke 4.16 So he came to Nazareth, Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as the custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. So when Jesus was here on earth, he worshipped on which day? The Sabbath. The seventh day. Because of this change, some people may ask, but haven't the Ten Commandments been changed? Have they? Have the Ten Commandments been changed? According to Jesus, he says, it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tittle of the law to fail. That means the smallest little dot. God said this, My covenant I will not break, nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. Did God speak the commandments? That's what came out of his lips. He said, I'm not going to alter it. I'm not going to alter it. And he says, For I am the Lord, I do not change. Interesting. So they might have a few questions in your mind. Some people have told me, they asked me this, Wasn't the Sabbath changed to Sunday at Christ's death or resurrection? What do you think? Let's take a look at a few texts. Let's see what the Bible says. Exodus 20, verse 11. We just read this. The Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So he's telling us that he made the seventh day holy. We established. Does everybody agree that that was the Sabbath that we're talking about, at least back here in the Old Testament? Anybody have a dis discrepancy with that? I just want to make sure. So next, in Genesis chapter 2, we read this. God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. He did this at creation. He did this before sin. And all of my life, I was taught that the Sabbath was done away with when Jesus died on the cross. But when somebody pointed out to me Exodus chapter 20, and I read verses 8 through 11, and I really thought about it, I don't know how in the world I missed it. I don't know how I read that so many times. I, I, felt, I felt like my church had just misled me. And I believed them because that's what they taught me. Notice this verse. Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils. The reason I put this up here is because when Jesus had died, they wanted to pull him down off the cross before the Sabbath began. Do you remember that? We're not going to look those texts up because we have a lot of material to cover and I'm trying to slow down because the other night... I was told I sounded like an auctioneer. <laughs> and I'm just, I'm trying to take my time and I don't want to run over too much tonight. But I want to make sure that this all sinks in. But what had happened was they wanted to get Jesus down off the cross before Sabbath began. And the custom was they would break the legs of the people if they hadn't died yet. They would break their legs so that they'd fall down. They couldn't support themselves and they'd suffocate. So what did they do? They broke the legs of the thief on one side and they broke the legs of the man on the other side. But when they got to Jesus, he was already dead, wasn't he? He had already died. And that fulfilled a prophecy that said, not a bone shall be broken. He was the Lamb of God. So when we look at this, they wanted to take him down off the cross and go prepare his body in the tomb before Sabbath began. But here's what they did. These women, it says, then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. Did they keep the Sabbath after Jesus died on the cross? They did. Yes. And the very next verse, the, the chapter ends in Luke 23, 56, and the very next verse says, now on which day? Perfect. On the first day of the week, very early, early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. And, of course, Jesus wasn't in the tomb. He had already been resurrected. This was early Sunday morning. The point is, Jesus' death did not do away with the seventh-day Sabbath according to this verse, anyway. 
And notice the Sabbath precedes the first day. According to the Bible, the Sabbath is Saturday, not Sunday. So when we look at texts like this, you know, the interesting thing is about Luke, the one that wrote this. And I want you to understand, too, that the chapters are just put there so we can identify it. It's not a different story when the chapter changes. It's the same succeeding story. But Luke wrote two books of the Bible, and it was the book of Luke and the book of Acts. And he says that in the book of Luke, he wrote about all of Jesus' teachings in, in Acts 1, 1 through 3. He makes it clear he tried to write about everything that he could about Jesus' teachings. But he never wrote that the law had changed from Sabbath to Sunday. He never wrote that. But isn't Sunday the Lord's Day? I've heard that many times. Have you? Anybody? Lots of people? Yeah. Sunday is the Lord's Day. But what's the Bible say? Uh, Isaiah 58, 13, it says, Call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord. That sounds like the Lord's Day to me. Matthew 12, 8, For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. That makes it very clear. The Bible speaks of the Lord's Day in Revelation chapter 1, verse 10 also. So the Lord's Day, the Lord does have a special day. Which day is it? It's got to be Sabbath. Because there's not one verse of Scripture that refers to Sunday as the Lord's Day. Not one. Where did that idea come from? Where did it come from? Let's look at another verse here. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. So this is the only day that was ever blessed by God. And it's the only day ever claimed by Him and His Son as a holy day. And that's the seventh day. Well, the next question is, if Sunday Sabbath isn't in the Bible, whose idea was it? What's the title of this sermon? Do you remember? Changing Times and Laws. Is, is the, are the Ten Commandments part of God's law? Yes. When we look at the days ending in the evening, according to the Bible, the, the evening was the end of the day, and when the sun sets, the day ends, and the new day begins at sunset. That's how time was reckoned in the Bible. Has the time been changed? Yes, because now we say at midnight the day ends. But according to the Bible, the day ends when the sun goes down, and that's when the new day begins. So whose idea was it? Let's take a look at this. This is the verse that we've developed this sermon about. The last part of this verse. This power, who we identified the other night as the Antichrist power, shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. When did this happen? This is what we have to establish. When did this happen? Can you grab my water for me, please? Jason, I'm sorry if I'm here. Thank you very much. When did this happen? Well, let's take a look at this. This is actually uh, from lectures on the history of the Eastern Church. It says, The retention of the old pagan name of Dia Solis, or Sunday, for the weekly Christian festival, is in great measure owing to the union of pagan and Christian sentiment with which the first day of the week was recommended by Constantine in 321 AD to his subjects, pagan and Christian alike, as the venerable day of the sun. It was his mode of harmonizing the discordant religions of the empire under one common institution. Who was Constantine? What power was he? The Roman Empire. This is the Roman Empire. Who do we say that beast was? It was Rome. It's very clear in Scripture. Nine identifying characteristics. We touched on them Tuesday. So Constantine was the one who, he actually made it a law. See, what happened was he had two groups of people. He had the Christians that were worshiping on Sabbath, according to what Jesus had taught, and according to what Christians had done for hundreds of years at this point. And even the Jewish people, all through the Old Testament for 4,000 years, we have people, well, not the Jews for 4,000 years, but people for 4,000 years keeping the Sabbath. And then when the Jews came along, they were to keep the Sabbath also. And so this Roman emperor had the, the Christians that were worshiping on Sabbath, and people who were worshiping the sun gods were worshiping on Sunday. They were worshiping on Sunday. So what he did was he says, you know, I've got these two groups of people, and 
you know, the Christians don't really cause much trouble. They're, they're not much trouble for me. And the pagans, this group of pagans is so large, we need to bring them together because with unity comes power. Would you agree? If you, can, if you have just two people unified, it's, it's okay. But you get 10 or 20 or 50 or 100, you become a mighty army, don't you? So what happens here is he says, if I can bring these two groups together and have them worshiping on one day, it'll unify my kingdom. So what day did he choose? He chose Sunday because the Christians will just kind of, they won't give him much flack. If he would have switched it to Sabbath and said, this is the day, well, the pagans might have risen up and given him some problems. Here's the thing. This Roman power is changing or intending to change God's law from Sabbath to Sunday. Let's continue on. Matthew chapter 5, 15, verses 6 and 9, it says, Thus you have made the commandments of God of no effect by your tradition, and in vain they worship me, teaching the doc as doctrines the commandments of men. If God says that the Sabbath is Saturday, and man says that it's Sunday, I've got to keep God's Sabbath. I can't follow men. See, it's, danger. it's dangerous to tamper with God's law. And, and some might be thinking, well, there are other texts that seem to contradict this. And, and I don't have time tonight to go into it. There is a lecture on the website called The Lost Day in History. And if you go to prophecyhope.com, go to 2012 videos, look at The Lost Day in History, you will be able to see the whole thing. And all of the details are there. And I take on every controversial scripture that I've ever had anybody argue at this point. And we just don't have time to do it tonight because we're trying to establish this changing of times and laws. Mark 2.27, the Sabbath was made for man. It doesn't say for the Jews, but for mankind. This is all men and women all around the world at all times. The Sabbath was made for man. So you see, the Jewish nation didn't even exist until 2,500 years after the Sabbath was made holy in the Garden of Eden. Interesting. Most of us say, oh, that's the Jewish Sabbath. No. It's God's Sabbath. Look at the following facts. Sunday is the first day. We know that. We talked about it. Eight times in the New Testament, Sunday is mentioned. Or the first day is mentioned. It doesn't say Sunday, but we know when it says the first day. We know what day it's talking about. Number three, it's never set aside in honor of the resurrection. Yet a lot of churches honor it because of the resurrection. It's never called the Lord's Day, and it's never mentioned even once by Jesus. Wow. Sunday is not mentioned by Jesus in the Bible, or the first day, let's say. Jesus kept the seventh day. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. His followers rested on the Sabbath day, according to the commandment, after the cross. And the Sabbath was kept in Acts by both Jews and Gentiles. Both Jews and Gentiles. And it's there, friends. I can show you if you like. So what do other commentaries and churches have to say about the seventh day Sabbath? Now, if you were here Tuesday night, I think some people, I got some response, and some people were really surprised to see what their church taught about the Antichrist power. They were really shocked that the Reformers believed what we're teaching here. Well, let's take a look at what some commentaries have to say. This is Webster's Dictionary. It says, Sunday, so-called, because this day was anciently dedicated to... That's not the Son of God. That's the Son, the solar Son. Or to its worship, the first day of the week. Interesting. Next, Sunday, it's a noun... This is a Chambers uh, College Dictionary. The first day of the week. Called this because in ancient times it was a day for worship of the sun. S-U-N. Next. Uh, Canon Tradition, page 263. The authority of the church could therefore not be bound to the authority of the scriptures because the church had changed the Sabbath into Sunday. The church, it says. Hmm. Not by a command of Christ, but by what? its own authority. By its own authority. The American Catholic Quarterly Review, January 1883. Protestantism is discarding the authority of the church. I'm in discarding the authority of the church, 
Let's start over. Protestantism, in discarding the authority of the church, has no good reason for its Sunday theory. We have Protestants in here. I'd say most of us here are Protestants. There might be a couple of Catholics. And it says, and all logically to keep Saturday with the Jews. Interesting. This is the Catholic Church saying this. Catholic Press. Sunday is a Catholic institution. And its claims to observance can be defended only on Catholic principles. For the begin from the beginning to the end of Scripture, there is not a single passage that warrants the transfer of weekly public worship from the last day of the week to the first. Catholic Mirror. The Catholic Church, for over 1,000 years before the existence of a Protestant, by virtue of what? Her divine mission, that's the Church's mission, changed the day from Saturday to Sunday. Is this new to anybody? Interesting, isn't it? The papal controversy, this is a 1892 paper. It says, from, from this same Catholic church, you have accepted your Sunday, and that Sunday as the Lord's Day, she has handed down as a tradition. And the entire Protestant world has accepted it as tradition. For you have not an iota of Scripture to establish it. In other words, not even the smallest part of Scripture to establish Sunday worship. Edward Hiscox, author of the Baptist Manual. Listen to this. This is a Baptist. This is in their manual. There was and is a commandment to keep holy the Sabbath day. But that Sabbath day was not Sunday. It will be said, however, with some show of triumph that the Sabbath was transferred from the seventh to the first day of the week. Earnestly desiring information on this subject, which I have studied for many years, I ask, where can the record of such a transaction be found? Not in the New Testament, absolutely not. There is no scriptural evidence of the change of the Sabbath institution from the seventh to the first day of the week. Have you ever heard that? in your Baptist church? This is the Convert's Catechism of Catholic Doctrine. I have one, if you'd like to look at it, it's just a small one. Um, there is one that's very large, mine's about maybe 120 pages, and it's for those who, if you want to become a Catholic, the priest will give you a catechism, and you study it, and it's in question-answer format. And it'll ask a question, and it'll give you the answer. And I was telling Rick, I, I sat down last night for I got home about 11.30, I guess. And, uh, um, no, last night I got home early, but it was about 11.30. I sat back and I cracked open the catechism and I was just looking through it. And with the exception of about four pages out of 120, there was not a scripture anywhere in there. Not one verse to back up anything that was being said. And that disturbed me greatly. We should always have scriptural evidence for any comment that we make about... Uh, what we believe and why we believe it. We should be able to support it somehow from Scripture. But this is what the Catechism says. The Convert's Catechism, it asks the question, which is the Sabbath day? It gives the answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. This is the Catholic Catechism. Why do we observe Sunday instead of Sabbath? Because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. The Catholic Church did it. This is a doctrinal catechism. It says, have you any other way of proving that the church has the power to institute festivals of precept? It goes on. Had she not such power, she could not have done that, which all modern religionists agree with her. In other words, what they're saying is, you know, if you're a Protestant and you're keeping Sunday, then you're giving your, your authority belongs to the Catholic Church. You've given them the authority to do that. That's what he's saying here. He goes on, she could not, could not have substituted the observance of Sunday for the first day of the week for the observance of Saturday, the seventh day, a change for which there is no scriptural authority. This is a lot of evidence. This is a Catholicism and Fundamentalism by Carl Keating, page 38. Fundamentalists meet for worship on Sunday. Yet there is no evidence in the Bible that corporate worship was to be made on Sundays. Now, they say the Jewish Sabbath, this is a misnomer. That's what he wrote. But people have a tendency to call it the Jewish Sabbath, but we've established that the Sabbath existed 2,500 years before the first Jew. So it can't be a Jewish institution. So this is something that people say, and it's incorrect. 
The Jewish Sabbath, or day of rest, was, of course, Saturday. It still is Saturday, friends. It was the Catholic Church that decided Sunday should be the day of worship for Christians in honor of the resurrection. Here's another one. I cut some of these out. I've got tons of quotes. You may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and you will not find a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. The scriptures enforce the religious observance of Saturday. Just, just a couple more. In his book, Arguing for Sunday Worship, D.A. Carlson admits there is not a hint anywhere in the ministry of Jesus that the first day of the week is to take on the character of the Sabbath and replace it. There's one more quote. Harold, Harold Winslow in Christianity Today writes, There is nothing in Scripture that requires us to keep Sunday rather than Saturday as a holy day. <clears throat> and here's a little photo. I had to take this picture. I hope you can read it from your seat. I'll read it to you. It says, A word about Sunday. This is from the Catechism Simply Explained, page 89. You can find some of these things in the Stanton Library, by the way. <clears throat> a word about Sunday. God said, Remember that thou keep holy the Sabbath day. The Sabbath was Saturday, not Sunday. Why then do we keep Sunday holy instead of Saturday? The church altered the observance of the Sabbath to the observance of Sunday in commemoration of our Lord having risen from, dead, from the dead on Easter Sunday and of the Holy Ghost having descended upon the apostles on which Sunday? Protestants who say that they go by the Bible and the Bible only I lost my place. And that they do not believe anything that is not in the Bible must be rather puzzled by the keeping of Sunday when God distinctly said, keep holy the Sabbath day. Interesting. The word Sunday does not come anywhere in the Bible. So without knowing it, they are obeying the authority of the Catholic Church. That's pretty powerful, guys. Sunday sacredness. The naked truth about it. It's not found in the Word of God. It's never kept by the Lord Jesus. And it's not found in God's holy law. So can we be certain that the present seventh day of the week, Saturday, is the same Sabbath that was kept holy by Jesus? Can we be absolutely sure? Let's take a look at this. Um, I'm afraid it's going to do that. There we go. I don't, I don't know why, but there's a glitch in my system. It's showing you the slide, but it's not coming up. So this is the calendar of 1582. Let me explain. The calendar has been altered. And a lot of people say, well, we really can't be sure. We really don't know. We've lost track of time. We don't know what day of the week it is. So we're just doing the best we can. Not true. Not true at all. You see, we are on what's called the Gregorian calendar. Are you familiar with that? The Gregorian calendar? Now, just before the Gregorian calendar, there was the Julian calendar. Now, the Julian calendar had 365 days in a year and had a leap year every four years. And you say, well, that's the calendar we're on. Now, let me back up. The Jews' calendar was 360 days because they went by the lunar cycle. But the Julian calendar came about and it has a leap year every four years and 365 days a year. Doesn't that sound like ours? That sounds like the calendar we have. But the Gregorian calendar is a little bit different. Uh, first of all, before I go on, you see this month of October here? That's the month we're in right now. How many legs does an octopus have? Eight. Which month is this? What? Tenth? October? Hmm. That's interesting. How about December? That's 10. That's 10. The Decalogue, remember I said that earlier? December is the 10th month. November is the 9th month. October is supposed to be the 8th month. Well, what happened? Well, Julius Caesar wanted to put, uh, he wanted to have more days in the calendar than anybody else. So he named July after himself, Julius Caesar. He put 31 days in the calendar. And so, uh, Pope Gregory, he wasn't going to be outdone, so he made the month of August and he put 31 days there too. That's why we have July and August side by side with 31 days. But it all works out. We have 365 days 
in a year and, and leave here every four years. Are you following? On the Gregorian calendar, you have 365 days in a year, five days, 49 minutes, and 12 seconds. Pope Gregory figured this out in the 1500s. And even with today's instrumentation, they can't get it any closer. They say he was right, dead, spot on. So what happened was, we had gotten ahead of ourselves. And Pope Gregory figured out there were days that have to be removed from the calendar. Days have to come out. So what happened was Thursday, October the 4th, see it right here? Thursday, October the 4th was followed by, come on, ah, uh, it didn't switch. That's okay. Uh, let me, uh, it'll, I'll get it to switch. It'll, it's, it's running through a cycle right now. <laughs> I'll just talk until it runs. It, it'll switch here in a minute. So what I want to explain to you is, remember we talked about how the, the day was a little off and they had to adjust the calendar? Well, on the... Uh, a year has to be evenly divisible by four. So it's not that we have a, we had to make up that time for the, uh, the 11 minutes that weren't there. You see what I'm saying? In other words, if it's 365 days, so many hours, so many minutes and seconds, we've got some minutes there that we have to deal with. So over a period of years, we end up with too many days. One has to be subtracted out. So what they did was, if there's, if there's any year that is divisible by both the number 400 and 100, you don't have a leap year that year. So you have a leap year every four years, but in, in, and in the year 1600, there was a leap year. But in the year 1700, there wasn't because it's not divisible by 400. In the year 1800, there wasn't. In the year 1900, there was no leap year. But in the year 2000, did we have a leap year? Yes. But in the year 2100, because it's not divisible by both 100 and 400, there will not be a leap year because they have to make up for those days. Isn't that interesting? And he figured that out almost 500 years ago. It's just, it's unbelievable to me. So, that's, there we go. So, here we have the calendar. Let me see if I can. Yes, I back it up, good. So we have Thursday, October the 4th, right? Is followed by Friday, October the 15th. This is what they did in 1582. Pope Gregory did this to change the calendar. Yes, the calendar has been altered. But I want you to notice something. The day of the week didn't change. We've always had that 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Sabbath. It's never changed. Even the Jews agree that the Sabbath that we understand is the same Sabbath that they're keeping today. And they have been meticulously counting that for thousands of years. They have not lost track of it. Isn't that interesting? So just a little lesson on the calendar. <clears throat> The other thing, <clears throat> excuse me, in over 105 languages in the world, the word for the seventh day of the week is Sabbath. Anybody know what Sabbath is in Spanish? Come on. Sabbath. <clears throat> what is it in Greek, huh? You don't know? I don't know. Uh, you were Greek, man. I figured you'd know that. You can't eat what you say. <laughs> you don't know. That's okay. But it's the same word. It's the same, I think it's Sabota. So, uh, even in Spanish, you said sabado, right? And then it's uh, sabota in Greek, I believe. And I'm not sure what it is in, in Italian, but if you look at all these different languages, the seventh day is Sabbath. That's what it's called, not Saturday. In America, we use a pagan name, and named after Saturn. Okay, uh, another quote here from the Catholic Encyclopedia. The church, after changing the first day of rest from the Jewish Sabbath, there it is again, the Jewish Sabbath, of the seventh day of the week to the first. After changing the day of rest from the Jewish Sabbath of the seventh day of the week to the first, made the third commandment, whoa, the third commandment? Didn't we say it was the fourth commandment? But the Catholic Encyclopedia is saying they made the third commandment refer to Sunday as the day to be kept holy as the Lord's Day. This is both changing times and law. They're doing them both right here with this one statement. Because what they're doing is they've changed not only the Sabbath day when it was, but they've transferred it back to the third commandment. What happened? Does anybody here have a catechism? I invite you to go home and look at it. Or you can look at mine. I'm going to show you a picture of one here in just a moment. Um, 
So what happened is they've changed not only the times and the law by doing this. And this is what happened. Well, let's, let's read this first. Remember we read the, the Ten Commandments, and the second commandment was, you shall not bow down to serve idols, right? We shouldn't do that. That's, that's, the, that's actually the second commandment. That's the second commandment. So I have to keep this straight in my head. So here you go. The, the biblical Ten Commandments are on the right. Now we've shortened them for the sake of being able to fit them all on one page. Okay? But you notice the first one is you shall have no other gods before, no strange gods before me, no other gods, it says, because this is straight from the Catechism. You shall not make for yourself an idol. Where'd it go? It's not there. This is right out of the Catechism, friends. They skipped from the... They, they removed the second commandment. It's gone. And now the, the, fourth, the third one becomes the second, the fourth one becomes the third, and so on down the line. Well, how do we end up with, with Ten Commandments? Well, what they did was they took the one you shall not covet, and they split it into two. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, you shall not cover, covet your neighbor's goods. Interesting. Is this not changing God's law? Absolutely. That's what they've done. They've removed the one about idols. Why? Why did they do that? Well, they have to. They have to. I've been to Catholic churches numerous times and I see people go down and they bow down to the image and they do the sign of the cross and they move on. They'll kiss the toe. They kiss the toe off of one of the things over in St. Peter's Basilica. It's just, it's gone. They've kissed it so much and it's marble. <laughs> and they bow and they worship idols. We need to pray for these folks, friends. They need to hear these truths. They need to hear it. We need to hear it. I would call this changing God's law. There's no way of getting around it. There's no way. So the Sabbath was changed and the second commandment was removed. Is there another way that there was a changing of times and laws? Yes, there is. If you were here on Monday, then these next few slides will be a review for you. Okay? Notice the statement from the Catholic Church. As human beings, we have been made in the image and likeness of God Himself. I agree. I think you all would agree with that after Monday's lecture. And it's just from knowing the Bible. We're made in the image of God. It tells us that in Genesis. But here's where I can't agree any longer. God, who is one and yet three simultaneously... God, the Most Holy Trinity, is the communion of three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Each of these persons is a uniqueness. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, but that the Father is not the Son, nor is the Son the Father, and the Holy Spirit is neither the Father nor the Son, and yet together the three uniquenesses are in fact one. Does that make sense to anybody? <laughs> you know... Here's what another church states. They've taken this statement and they've simplified it. There is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a unity of three co-eternal persons. This is a short version of what the last comment was, and this is from another Christian church. And this is in agreement with the Catholic Church. Yet, what does the Bible say? Yet, for us, there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for Him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. That does not say that. Whose idea is this? It's man's. Whose word is this? It's God's. Here's another one, John 17, 3. Such a simple text that most of you have memorized. And this is eternal life, that they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. There's nothing about a trinity in that. There's one God, the Father. Exodus chapter 20, verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall have no other gods before me. That's what God says. Remember this, the Shema. The most holy of all texts, according to the Hebrews, or the Jews, which are the Hebrews. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is 
Three and one. One and three. No. He is one. One Lord. He's one. And this was the beginning of the first commandment. I'm going to do this for review because if you remember I said that somebody had asked Jesus which is the most important of all the commandments. And we always say, oh, it's to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second life it is this, that you love your neighbor as yourself. That's not how he started. At least not here in Mark chapter 12. Jesus answered, the first of all the commandments is here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. The same thing we're seeing there. This is what Jesus says is the first commandment. So it does matter what we believe. Is our concept of God important? Absolutely. And we talked about Constantine. We talked about the Sabbath. That he changed it from... Three, in 321, he changed it from Sabbath to Sunday. There's nothing in the Bible that tells us that that changed. The Council of Nicaea in 325 is where the Trinity Doctrine was first introduced to Christianity. And the Trinity distorts who God is. Now, I want you to turn here, Matthew chapter 4, with me. We're getting close to the end, folks. We're almost done. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1. Seminar Bible, page 937. And this is uh, right after Jesus had been baptized. You remember this account? Jesus was baptized. And if you look at verse 4, let's start in verse 1, rather. Everybody there? Matthew 4, verse 1. Here we go. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you... I like this. Where is he hitting first? If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. Let me ask you something. Did the devil know he was the Son of God? The devil knew Jesus was the Son of God, but he's saying, if. He's trying to cast doubt. You notice Jesus was hungry here. He had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. In the Garden of Eden, what did, what did the serpent tempt Eve with? Food. This is what he's tempting Jesus with. So he says, if you are the Son of God, command these stones become bread. Verse 4, and he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He's talking about his father there. Then the devil took him up to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written. And here the devil's quoting scripture. Psalm 91. He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Does the devil know the Bible? Yes, he does. Better than we do. Better than we do. So he knows how to twist it and distort it and change things around. So we have to study. Verse 7. Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. He's talking about his father there. And again, in verse 8, The devil took him on, out, took him on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. What did the devil want? He wanted worship. He wanted worship. Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. You familiar with that? Now you can read this account also in Luke chapter 4, verse 5. But the devil wanted worship. He wanted worship in the Garden of Eden. He wanted worship from the Son of God. Yeah. And he wants worship from you. He wants your worship. Can he have it? Look what this says. Isaiah 14. For you have said in your heart. This is talking about Lucifer. This is Isaiah 14 is a prophecy. It's talking about Lucifer. It's actually, it had already happened by that time. For you have said in your heart, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will be like the Most High. He wants to exalt himself to be equal with the one who created him. He was trying to get worship in the garden. 
He was trying to get worship from Jesus, and he's trying to get worship from you. Notice this text, or this, I'm sorry. Isn't it logical that Satan would attack the law of God? Because in that law is the very character of God himself. And he's, ten he's attempting this through the Antichrist power. If we are believing the doctrines that the Antichrist power has laid down, and we're accepting them, and we're believing them against Scripture, then where's our worship going? It's going to say, that's exactly right. Here's a catechism. In her catechism, she has omitted the second commandment against the veneration of images and divided the tenth commandment into two. We saw that, right? Next. She shortened the fourth commandment from 94 words to just eight and changed the Sabbath day. Next, they changed the identity of God from the one true God to a trinity or a triune God, which includes a false concept of a third being. What do I mean when I say that? Well, according to the Bible, there are only two beings in all of the universe that are worthy of our worship. That's the Father, Right here. For as the new heavens and the new earth which I shall make, which I make shall stand before me, declares Jehovah, so your seed and your name shall stand, and it will be from the new, one new moon to another, or from new moon to new moon, and from Sabbath to Sabbath. Friends, this is in the context of the new world, talking about from Sabbath to Sabbath. And it says, All flesh shall come to worship before me, says Jehovah, Yahweh. Lord, all caps in the Bible. That's the Father. Next, here's the other one we can worship. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten, who's the first begotten? Jesus Christ. He brings him into the world. He saith, let all the angels of God, what? Worship him. We can worship the Son because he's the same substance as the Father. Again, Philippians 2.9. Wherefore God hath also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Are there any scriptures that say that the Holy Spirit can be worshipped? No, there's not. Not one. I, I was supposed to show you this. This is another text. Um, God, which this is Revelation 7, 9, and 10. Rick gave this to me and I put it in. And I forgot I put it in there, Rick. I appreciate you giving it to me. After this I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb. Where are we at this time? We're in heaven. Clothed with white robes and palms in their hands and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth, sitteth upon the front throne, and unto the Lamb. Who's the Lamb? Jesus. It's Jesus. So, when we look at a text like this, and we look at the other text, how many people are worthy of worship that are in heaven? The Father and His Son. And that is it. There are two. There are two. So my question was, is, is there any text in the Bible that says that the Holy Spirit can be worshipped? The answer is no. Not one. So according to the Bible, if there's only two beings in the universe that are worthy of worship, and we're giving it to a third being, who's receiving that worship? Satan's. And I know that hits hard. And I know that hurts. But that is the truth. That is the truth. Look at this text again. I put the whole text there this time. Isaiah 14, 13 and 14. The devil says, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Now this is very interesting wording. If you've ever done any kind of study on the Old Testament sanctuary, you'll notice in that sanctuary, which represents the Father and the Son, you'll notice that on the north side of the temple, isn't that where it is, Rick? Where the table of showbread sits? On the north side? That table of showbread, there were two stacks of showbread. Two stacks. One for the Father and one for the Son. That's exactly right. Where's the third? There is none. On that table, there were two crown moldings. Crown moldings. There were two crown moldings, not three. 
One represents the Father, one represents the Son, because one was above the other. It doesn't mean that the Father is above the Son, but He has the authority to give to the Son. He has given the Son equality. But the reason one is above the other is showing that the Father gives all authority to His Son. Interesting. So the naked truth about the doctrine of the Trinity, it's not found in the Word of God. Jesus and His disciples never taught the doctrine. It had its origin in ancient Babylon. We talked about that Monday night. Number four, it wasn't taught by Christians until the 4th century. The Council of Nicaea. We said that the Sabbath was changed in the 4th century. Four years before the Council of Nicaea. Constantine was there. The Roman Empire was involved. Number five, it falsifies the identity of the one true God and His Son, Jesus Christ. And number six, it cannot be clearly explained or understood as you saw just a moment ago. So I guess the next question we need to ask ourselves is what will I believe? Who will I worship? Will I worship the one true God? Or no? Am I going to believe what the Bible says? Or am I going to believe tradition? God's law cannot be changed. It cannot. And one last thing. All of God's commandments are short. They stand fast forever and ever. Psalm 111. All thy commandments are true. The law of the Lord is perfect. Verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth shall pass, not one jot or tittle shall in no way pass from the law. These are powerful things, friends. And I know a lot of things are probably going through your head. You know, most of us probably had no idea that the Sabbath is Saturday. But God asked for holy time from us. On sundown tomorrow night, the Sabbath begins. And it ends sundown Saturday night. That's God's law. That's what He says. It's very clear. So, maybe we need to do some soul searching and some studying and look and see, are these things really true or am I going to stick with the Catholic doctrine? A doctrine that was man-made. So, please prayerfully think about these things. There's a handout on the back. Is there something? Rick, I want you to come up here because I try to get him to do that every night to critique these and uh, bring up something that maybe... Oh, one thing that I forgot to mention about it was that seventh day thing, wasn't it? Christ and, the and it was, uh, uh, you talked to us about how Christ died on a Friday. Yes. They took him down on the cross, off the cross before yes. the Sabbath Thank began. You. Let, me, let me address that very quickly. Jesus died, we know, on a Friday, right? We said that. When he died Friday, they got him down off the cross before Sabbath began. Friday was called the preparation day because they were preparing for the Sabbath to rest. So, God created the earth in six days and he rested on his seventh, on the seventh day from all his work of creating the world, right? Well, did you ever think that Jesus, when he died, he died on a Friday, he was in the tomb on the Sabbath, he rose on the Sunday? So just as God rested on the seventh day from his work of creating the world, Christ rested in the tomb on the seventh day from his work of saving the world. Does that make sense? He kept Sabbath even in his death. 